gentlemen, I appreciate you guys taking time out of the uh, busy campaign schedule to join us this afternoon on the, well again, my name is John Paris, I'm the uh, chair of our endorsement committee uh, here at the Asian American Group. Uh, on the left hand side of the screen for those uh, watching uh, online is Mr. John Cahill. He is the, uh, the Democratic uh, candidate for the role, excuse me, the, the seat of public administrator and he's currently the incumbent. And on my right hand side is Ed Klaproth. He is the Republican candidate for that same position. Um, first question that we're generally asking in most races is this, and we'll start with Ed. Uh, and then obviously John will have an opportunity to answer. Ed, why have you decided to run for this particular race at this particular time? Well, my opponent is a very good and hardworking man. However, we share a difference in philosophies. And my idea is to make the Office of Public Administrator more proactive to go out in the community. Um, I've recruited uh, uh, several attorneys who pro bono will be happy to go out with me and speak to every and any organization for free, no cost to participants, no cost to the taxpayers, to tell people how to avoid probate, make sure that, you know, my motto is if you plan for your retirement, you should plan for your passing. Because as a lay chaplain, I've dealt with a lot of grieving families, people who suddenly have to deal with being an executor or there's no will, uh, absolute chaos. And when you had your heart ripped out, you know, you're not thinking about legal technicalities, like about filing the uh, will with the court clerk in 30 days. You know, these things don't enter your mind. So when I saw, I have a, so this is my philosophy to go out in the community also to make sure that no one goes into the night alone. For those who die without anyone, I will find out, I will search diligently for their uh, relatives or friends, find out what their beliefs were, if they're completely alone. And when that last day comes, if they need an above ground burial, they get it or in ground, depending on their religious beliefs. And if I have to give the services, I will myself, because I've been trained to deal with many religions and philosophical beliefs being a chaplain. So I, that's one of the reasons I'm running. Okay. And John, why are you running for, I guess, re-election as opposed to? Well, I'll tell you, eight years ago, I sounded a lot like Ed, and I thought that uh, even though I worked as an investigator for the office for a couple of years, that's field work, and I had that view of the boss that uh, I'd have a lot of, I'd be making the choices, and I wanted to get out in the community and, and talk to people and uh, uh, tell them all the reasons why they need to make sure they have a will or they do other planning. And now that I've been in there, uh, you know, I find out how much work there is to do that keeps you in the office. Uh, financial institutions only want to speak to the guy whose name is on that court order. They want to speak to the person whose name is on the letters of administration. Uh, when I go to open a safety deposit box, I do that because that's who the banks want to see. Now my deputies have full authority to do that, but in, they, got, they also have a lot of work in the office because we're doing between three and 400 probates at any one time. I only have six staff, uh, but uh, um, the uh, getting out in the community would have been, as Ed said, I would have liked to have had that been a primary thing because I think you get a great return for that. And I've gone anywhere they ask me to speak. I've gone to UNLV adult education classes. I've gone to all kinds of community groups, uh, and I put on seminars with attorneys uh, for information for people. Uh, we did it for our first responders that was targeted at police and fire. And so we've done those things. And as Ed said, attorneys are very willing to step up and do that. I won't let them use it to advertise their services alone, but they're up there talking. And if someone wants to come up and get a card from them, that's, you know, that's a great thing. We don't the office very rarely is involved in burying anybody. We don't do that. The authority to do that is with the coroner, social services, and actually the sheriff has a certain authority, but he's never had to exercise it really. It, the coroner, between the coroner and social services, if there's nobody around to um, do burial arrangements, that's where it's done. And so 
the office really doesn't do that. Now, occasionally we'll come across one that has put it in a will. We end up being named as administrator because even though the will named an executor, that person is unwilling or unable to, to do that because the person may have chosen someone in their own age group, a sibling, a brother or sister, 25, 40 years ago, got put on the will. And now, when the time comes to do the role of executor, they're just not able to do it, so we get it. Uh, and we will follow the uh, directions given us at that time. But uh, most of those are done by social services. So I, I'm running again because uh, I never imagined I'd live this long and still be uh, interested in working. But it, it is an, it's a needed job, it's, an interesting, it's interesting work, and uh, I've learned a lot about it, so I'm not ready to step away yet. So I'm running for another term. Okay. Well, John, what ideas do you have since you've been in this position for a while? What ideas do you have, assuming you're uh, re-elected, and Ed, you'll have obviously the same opportunity to answer this question, um, to try and modernize or, or uh, make the, the process that individuals have to go through through your departments a little bit easier for them to bear? Well, uh, we're just bringing on board a new case management system that we believe will improve the efficiency, and it's one of those systems that's in the cloud, everything is all the information is kept securely in a remote location and backed up. We uh, access that system through a browser. Um, and so that, we think, is going to provide some improvements. A lot of work putting in a new computer system of any kind, actually, but a case management system. That's, that's a lot of work, and I hope to see that. I was unaware for a while that it's against the the court rules for me to submit a digital signature because I had filed petitions with digital signatures for a couple of years and they're 100% legal. I had checked that out with the district attorney. They're 100% legal in that. But court rules don't allow it. I just so happened I used a digital signature that used a JPEG of my signature in blue ink. So I think that the clerk never caught it. The court never caught it. It looks like my signature only it has some information that's attached that told what it was. So I went to the uh, you know, commissioner and I, and I went to the chief judge and I'm, I'm asking to see about getting the court rules changed so that a legal digital signature will satisfy filing a petition and I don't have to spend paper and ink. But I'm working with the DA's office. Uh, they have a project on digital signatures um, and I, our IT department. They have, they're also involved in the digital signature uh, move inside Clark County, because anything we can do to save all that paperwork, it's so annoying to print something out just to sign it. And, and on some of the things, uh, I still use them as legal for um, listing a real estate, listing a house for sale for real estate. I do all that digitally, so I'm working on those things. Okay, Ed. Okay, like with Johnson's, you know, I've been really in, um, although I'm not a computer whiz myself, I've been smart enough to realize that to get the best people I can to help me. And matter of fact, one of them sitting in the back in the room who's a computer programmer, and to bring those on board and to help not only with our own IT department in the county, but also to, I have volunteers who come in and help establish a secure system. Because nowadays with all the paperwork, you really, you can't, you know, be stacks and stacks of paper, like John said, it just slows up everything. And what's one of the things I look forward to is, you know, working also with the legislature when there's a problem. You know, I've been establishing relationships with people in both parties in a congenial manner. When you have rules that like, like the one where they, the person has to file the will of the party within 30 days. How many people know this? Nobody. I mean, a lawyer may know, but you know, who deals in wills, but an average person. So I've talked to them about, you know, when someone passes, alerting the family to this, not only in written form, but in oral communication. And a lot of the uh, legislatures agree with me that this is a foolish rule because people, when they're hurting, you know, this is the last thing they think of. We need a lot more, we need compassion. We need caring compassion in our bureaucracy. You know, too many people have the image of bureaucrats as the DMV. You know, we have to change that, especially the Office of Public Administrator. It has to be one that's 
open and warm. We have to have it welcoming them. We have to be there often to console because I've seen what it's like. I've actually, when I was a police officer, you know, you watch, you know, you're there when someone passes, like in an accident. You see the light go out of their eyes and their family comes and the distress that they're in. And to be the person that has to go to the door and tell someone that their, their loved one has died, that was, you know, you learn a lot through that. And one thing you learn is people need to come to a very to an institution that's there to help them. As I had one person, I said, do you have a will? Yes, I have a will. Well, who's your executor? Well, my grandfather. <laughs> your grandfather, I said. You know, how much older he is? Well, he's only 45 years older than me. I said, well, you know, did you plan on him living that long? I said, so if you're 60, he's going to be like 105? Well, you see, people often don't think. And that's where, you know, I have a lot of relationships with many, many groups in the city. And the idea is, I've talked to some like uh, Judge Pollock, who does some of the probate cases, he said it'd be great if people didn't have to go through probate. First of all, it's time consuming, it costs money. You know, let's cut down on the number of probate cases by people finding out how simple it is to avoid it. And that's where I look for education. And I will be doing this not on the company, not on the county's time, but on my own time. This will be something after work that I'll do. And you wonder, how can I do this? Well, my wife and my daughter have very varied schedules, so you know, we don't really see each other that much at home, so they wouldn't miss me because they're usually working then anyway. <laughs> because I'll be out there on my own time. No, you know, I don't think of this, you know, this is an addition <clears throat> to my regular duties. And I don't look at it for any remuneration for this. This is just something I love to serve. I've served people in various ways throughout my whole life. I'm not interested in monetary gain. I'm interested in helping people. Well, Ed, one thing that uh, we have brought up earlier today in discussions with the assessor's office and the county recorder's office is the concept of identity theft. Uh, obviously, in many of the documents that would be filed under the public administrator's office, they have a lot of particulars regarding an individual's name and, and well, date of birth, obviously. And, um, but there's always that concern that you know my grandmother's identity will now be assumed by someone else, causing problems, not necessarily for her, but for many others. Uh, what ideas do you have to try and make the identity th the make it more difficult for people who want to data mine or steal someone's identity of, of a decedent, uh, assuming you are elected? Well, one of the things we have to do is make sure you know. This is one thing I worry about the cloud. When we start storing data in the, in the cloud, we really have to have a good secure, the best security system available. Because you know hackers can get into anything they want. I mean, no matter what, how good our system is, there's somebody out there who can hack it. That's why sometimes people disagree with it, but you, know, you really need to hire the very best in security. You need to get the best programs available. And it is a concern because you know people do look. One thing you have to do is make sure you know that mail you know, when somebody who looks in the paper and reads somebody dies, well, maybe they're going to go to that mailbox then. Maybe they're going to go to that house, try and get those slips for those credit cards, start running up debts on the estate. You know, there can be a lot of problems this way. So the first thing to do is make sure that, you know, everything is shut down. The post office is going to start, you know, stopping that mail there. Or if they did have someone, a relative, they can forward it to. But, you know, one thing, too, is we have to encourage people in their wills you know, don't hide your will and don't put your will in the safety deposit box. How many people have I talked to, and I'm sure John was ended into it, where people think that that's the best place for it. Don't put it in there. It's really hard for us to get to then. Yeah, AARP, I found one of their websites, and they're still telling people, put your will in your safe deposit box. And I, and I tell them, that's okay as long as your named executor has access to that box. If they do not, the person that gets the court order to go get it, well, that will be your next of kin. And if your next of kin is that, but even even with that, having to go get a court order to get the bank to open that box is not a good way to do it. <coughs> so. What about the living will? So basically people are un undereducated, nobody knows whatever, right? Well, I think it's more than undereducated. It's the fact that people don't like to think about it. I mean, when I tell people what a public, first of all, they ask me, what does a public administrator do? In their minds, a lot of them think we're like the mayor. We're some sort of manager of the county. When I tell them, you know, 
basically we work with the deceased and their you know, kin, they're like, oh, it's one step back. It's like we don't want anything to do with that. Wouldn't that be great if that is, is part of a, a curriculum in I'd, say our I'd like to high see school. in the public schools. I'd like that to see in the high school. That would be wonderful because they don't know anything. <clears throat> and, and I'd like to see it in, call, in our public colleges. They think about their parents or elders. Yeah. What if they die? What do I do? Blah, 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 you know, rather than. You know, that's why I'd like to see, of course, in the high schools and in the colleges. Because, you know, at that stage, you know, kids think they're immortal. Yeah. I mean, when I was teaching, I once asked my students to write about death, and they put, if I die, I go, no, no, it's not an if, it's a when. I said, if you find out if, please tell me, because I'd like to know. But unfortunately, they have this attitude, and a lot of times it carries on into life, later in life, and they don't think about it. I mean, they'll plan for the retirement. You know, you have somebody in their 20s or 30s, they start putting in their IRA or their 401k, or they're working for the county, they have their retirement fund, but guess what? They're not, they don't want to think about their own passing. And you know, one thing too I found, you know, there is a federal law that states that any funeral power must accept a coffin or an urn purchased from another vendor. They must accept it without charge. And I hate to tell you how much you can save. You can actually buy coffins and urns wholesale. I mean, I'll be honest, my mother passed away a few years ago. She wished to be cremated. The urn was $350. Then I looked on the site. I could have bought the exact same one for 35. Coffins that went for six or seven thousand, seven or eight hundred wholesale, 24 hour delivery. Now I know most people aren't going to think about this, but you can buy it in advance and they will ship it when the time comes. But well, well, before, uh, we, we do need to balance things out. Yeah, but um, John. So, so John, uh, kind of two questions we've kind of gotten into um, uh, preventing identity theft of decedents and then kind of getting into educational opportunities, I guess, for younger people or people who may need to deal with this. So all yeah, I'll take those in reverse order. We really need to get families talking about this. And, and I tell, when I go out and speak to adults, you know, in this room, I'm sure that there are some in this room that still have elders in your family that are alive. But it's something that families just, well, it depends really on, on, the, uh, on the family's culture, religion, and some of those other kind of things. But a lot of times, families don't want to talk about it. I know, I tell kids, talk to the elders in your family. And you know, they go ask them and they go, don't worry about it, it's handled, it's taken care of. Uh, you need to know, you need to know where the will is, who's the named executor, you know. And I tell parents, I say, adult kids, talk to them. Tell them what your decisions are. They don't like them, that's the way it goes. But get it ironed out ahead of time. Don't have them deal with it later on. And so it's good to get families talking about it. Identity theft, uh, We've never had a problem with it. Uh, it's so much easier to get it someplace else than to go in through the county IT. The folks that are doing our new case management program are the biggest providers out there, and they have, you know, many, many uh, public administrators, public guardians in uh, California and, and, and Cook County, Illinois, um, uh, big counties in Texas. They provide this service to. They have the highest level of security for those kind of things. Uh, it's so much easier if you're going to be stealing identities to get it someplace else, you know, and that's what you see, you know, let's go get it from Target. Let's go get it from some of those kind of places. Actually, when it comes to uh, something I'd like to work more on preventing is I've been there eight years and just this, just this year was the first time that we've got someone prosecuted for elder exploitation. Uh, two guys took $425,000 from a woman her last weekend on earth, took her life savings. And uh, we tracked it down and got them caught. Uh, their sentencing comes up next month. What the, the kind of ringleader of the two uh, is going to do 18 months in prison. The other one got probation. They got to repay everything. Uh, we took the vehicles that they bought with their money. We took the residence that, that they bought with their money. 18 months? Yeah. That's all? Confiscated. That is all? As a criminal defense attorney, I'll tell you that's actually a very healthy amount considering it's strictly a financial crime. Send them to crime. China. <laughs> I thought China was a nice place. No, no get executed. Uh, oh. uh, yeah. But, no, that, that is, that is yeah, bad. like you say, 
Get, just getting someone to go to prison for this kind of a financial crime, I'm hoping after sentencing that, you know, we get to brag about it a little bit yeah. because people need to know, you take, you exploit the elderly, you can go to prison. And mm -hmm. it'll make a difference, I think, if we can have, but it is so hard to prove. And this all started because one of the investigators in my office found a deposit slip in the glove box of the decedent's car. And uh, they used bogus powers of attorney. Uh, they weren't valid in the bank. We got a lawsuit against the bank now. We want this estate made whole. And, uh, but I got great cooperation. You know, one of the things that Ed mentioned that I think is true, and I get some people that will ask me, why is this an elected position? Well, it wouldn't have to be. It could be appointed in some of the small counties. They've given it over to the district attorney's office. Somebody still has to do the work. Uh, but uh, it could be an appointed position like a lot of county department heads. But because we're out here, you know, like I was out visiting with Mo Dennis before he got interviewed, and we're all on the same campaign trail, we get to know the legislators and some of those kind of things. We can get some things done that an appointed person wouldn't get done as easily. So I got a law passed saying <coughs> that uh, Juveniles, um, if they're under a, ter a termination of parental rights, they still have the right to inherit. They didn't have that right before I got that, you know, got that introduced in the legislature. It seems crazy because we would have, I did 30 years as an officer for the juvenile court. That's something I did before I took this job on. I was retired for 10 years and, and got interested and came back. But uh, uh, yeah, I was astounded to find out that. Uh, child who's had parental rights terminated and was still a minor because it goes away after they're an adult couldn't inherit i said well that's like a parent abuses or neglects them during life and they get to do it during death i said that make any sense we got that change and then air hunters i don't know if you know anything about air hunters uh, it's a tv show in england but you don't hear much about it over here but these if they can get onto an estate they can run around knock on your door and say, I believe you have an inheritance, and if you'll sign here, we'll lead you to it, and we're only going to take a third. Sometimes it's more. Well, I got but, an uncle in Nigeria that keeps emailing us. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have the same uncle. Yeah, yeah well, we, 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 we must be related. I have to refuse. I can't participate in, in, in this endorsement because we're clearly family. <laughs> get those too. And, and what drives me crazy, some, now I'm getting some of them in my. Uh, uh, county email. I go, these people never let up. But we got a law passed that uh, any agreement signed within 90 days, any uh, air hunter agreement signed within 90 days of the date of death is invalid in Nevada. It sounds like, wow, that's pretty tough. Pennsylvania, it's illegal. You can't go around and do this to people. And what they don't tell them, of course, is that I may be out there hunting for them, and as soon as you know, I get, uh, I won't engage, we, I have a service that's a, a private detective, forensic genealogist to find people, and I use that. I found them all over the world, but I won't engage them until I know that the estate can pay for it. So. I like your question over there. What's the, your thoughts on the living trust? Living trust, not these people form living trust. So you know. Yeah, well, trust, of course, they pass on without going through probate. Okay. Uh, uh, one of the examples that people will ask me, well, isn't it good to have a trust? I said, well, it may be. Um, but uh, as long as the trustee does what they should do, if you're ever interested in seeing more about it, every Friday, uh, 9.30 at the family courts, you can go down and watch uh, probate court. As a probate commissioner, the orders are signed by a district court judge but it's probate court. Uh, there are more trusts heard by the court than there are probates. And you got, I say heard by the court, because if a trust is going wrong, they're gonna argue. If a probate goes wrong, the judge will put it on to hear, uh, you know, the petition. But 95% of the petitions for probate are just approved. If they go into court, if there's no objection, they're done. So we'll have a calendar of 130 cases and be out of there in two hours because he's only hearing half a dozen of them, but out of that, or a dozen of them, but out of that number, about 75% are trusts. 
because when a trust goes wrong, there's no way to fix it without going to court. And uh, But there are some really good things that a trust can do. If you own real estate outside of your state of residence, a trust is a great way to do that so you don't have to do an ancillary probate. But um, it doesn't fix everything unless everybody does what they're supposed to. So you only have six yeah. people yeah. in your office? Yeah. Wow. You have more than six people in the office. You only have six people in the office. I beat the office. More than the whole. Oh, no, no, no. There are only six of those were mine. The rest of those were air quality, and they moved okay, out. Okay, I mean, I can't be the office, I remember. Yeah, yeah, if you come over now, uh, yeah, it's lonely in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Freddie. We're, we're right at our time limit, so. We're okay. Up. Regarding ahead, will. For both. A written will. Is that how legal, or do you consider a legal will, I mean a uh, written will, legal, holographic. or it needs to be notarized? I know, holographic wills are legal in Nevada, there's a statute on that. And you know, I, st I really begin and end, because we handle so many questions calls, and I try to be quick with them and put them off. I tell people I can't give you legal advice, but we have a statute on holographic wills in Nevada, and they're 100% legal, I'll tell you how powerful they are. We had a case that we were in, and you can look it up on the, on the Supreme Court's website called Melton, M-E-L-T-O-N, uh, the Melton case. He disinherited his entire family with a holographic will. And no, holographic wills do not need to be witnessed. Uh, they must be in the hand of the testator, it means you've got to write it out. At least the principal provisions must be written out. And uh, uh, they're powerful in Nevada. Yeah. Holographic? Well, it prevents... It's, it's a legal term. Uh, um, written by hand. Oh. Will it prevent probate? Just a plain will? No. Prevent no. no. It doesn't. No, you go to... Even if you have a trust, you really should have a will, too. People forget that, that if you need both. You need both. Yeah, you need well, both. Maybe, maybe the school can teach most, not their parents die, they wish they didn't die, rather than... Most trust so a trust will prevent die. probate, but not a will. No, the wills have to go will through, has probate. To go through probate. Trust don't. Trust but, don't. And most trusts have what they call a pour-over will that pours it over. If you yeah. anything outside the trust, at, at your death it goes inside the trust. So if you forgot to put your car in the trust name or you bought a piece of property, you can get it put over into the trust so it can be distributed. And if you really trust your family, rights of survivorship. Um, right. On my house, my daughter is listed as has rights of survivorship. So that in case my wife and I did die, it would go immediately to her. So you only need the death certificate. By the way, that's one thing I tell people. When someone dies in your family, really order more death certificates than you think you're going to need. Because believe me, you'll be surprised who's going to ask for them. I yeah, did that and you didn't even need more than two. I, I got 12. <laughs> yeah. I got 25 okay. myself. And believe it or not, I used 24 of them. Well, on, that, on that, that happy note. Yeah. <laughs> pay, pay on death. Uh, bank accounts and investment accounts move outside of probate. Uh, deed on death of real property in Nevada. You can deed on death real property. you got to file it so that it's on record. Uh, that moves outside of probate. The only thing you need to do is make sure when you're not only consulting your lawyer on these things, you, you do a tax consult on yes. it because it can impact this gift on your death. Can, it can have an impact on who it's passing along to. I always get a good CPA. And one thing I'll tell you is God, all the costs. I understand like a lot of the needs of the Asian community because I lived in Japan and Korea and Singapore. My wife is Japanese, as is my daughter. My friends are Chinese, Korean, Malaysian, Indonesian. So I have a lot of knowledge of the people's cultural backgrounds. I speak Japanese. And, you know, proof is in the pudding, so if anybody wants to see it, you always hear politicians say things. Pictures. <laughs> Pictures worth a thousand words, so if you'd like to see them, you're more than welcome to. Like my Q1, if this is well, Senator Maisie Hirono. We'll, we'll trust you, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> but, again, gentlemen, we hey, appreciate thank everything. Thank you very much. Thank